This morning, great to welcome everyone who's gathered to worship God. I'm going to begin by bringing some announcements, and there are quite a lot, so please do bear with me as we, we go through these announcements this morning. Tonight it's our sharing service, and I've asked those who are involved on the UBM team during the summer to share this evening, so come this evening to hear about UBM, how God answered prayer and the benefits of going on short-term mission work. It'd be great to see you out tonight at 6 p.m. There'll be no meeting tomorrow evening um, due, to a, due to the bank holiday for the Queen's funeral. On Wednesday, we'll be parents and toddlers. On Friday, we'll be running baseline and prime youth clubs as usual. And next Sunday, our services are at 10.30 and 6 p.m. as usual. Please speak to me if you don't currently receive the information via email, so I can uh, sign you up for our email, which means you'll have all the information every Friday. Now we're going to hear, at this moment, some different opportunities that there are to serve our church family. And Kevin, who's um, currently serving as a steward at the back, is going to come and put a different hat on and tell us another way that we can serve. Thank you, Kevin. Michael, and, uh, good morning everybody. Uh, if I can just have your attention for a few moments, it's good of Michael to say that I was going to present you with an opportunity. It uh, it rather presents me as a uh, sort of an aspiring um, estate agent or used car salesman, I suppose. Uh, really, it's a request for some assistance. I don't know when you turn up at church in the morning whether you uh, whether you look round and you think, oh, it looks nice in here, or whether you think, look at the muck here, this needs a bit of attention. But um, the truth is, um, many people over the years have uh, recognised that we're very blessed to have our own premises. But of course the premises need looking after, and uh, a number of the church family have served very faithfully in making sure that the church is nice and clean and spick and span. Uh, but of course time moves on and the challenges of life come on and people decide to, to hang up their tickling sticks and things. And uh, more recently, the last couple of years, a different group of people have been cleaning the church on a rotor basis. Uh, there are about seven or eight groups, uh, seven or eight pairs, and it works out that uh, we need to clean the church about once every six or eight weeks or so. Um, but over the summer, uh, a couple more people have needed to drop out due to other pressures, and with holiday arrangements and things, the team has started to look a little bit fragile. So I was going to ask if uh, if it's not occurred to you before, how the church gets cleaned, and it's something you think you might be able to help with, then indeed it is uh, an opportunity to serve God and the church family. Uh, and if you'd like to know more about that, then, then please speak to us afterwards. Of course, at the moment, there's a slightly different way of thinking about that. If you've been here the last couple of weeks, uh, listening to the ministry from Michael and Sam, uh, or if you've been listening to it on the... Uh, on the, on the webcast, um, you'll be aware that we've been challenged to think about how the church is organised, uh, specifically we've been thinking about the call to leadership, but of course that's in the context of recognising that every member of the church family has a gift and a responsibility to exercise it, and it just struck me that um, you know, there might be some of you out there who are longing to get involved in a different way in serving in the church. So. Uh, the opportunity to join the church rota is a good one and pertinent at this time. There's a slight awkwardness uh, that I feel at the moment because, and, and I'll get no prizes for mentioning this and uh, don't intend to cause embarrassment, but Michael and Holly faithfully serve on the, uh, on the cleaning rota. And if you remember back to last week, Sam reminded us of the account in Acts chapter 6 
where the early church actually got itself in a little bit of a mess because some of the church leaders were distracted by some of the more practical things that were going on. They were actually running uh, what we now call a food bank, and uh, the requirements of the food bank admin uh, were distracting them from the ministry of the word. So they decided, uh, under God's direction, to appoint different people to these more practical ministries, specifically the food bank, uh, so that those who'd been selected as leaders and to provide spiritual oversight to the church uh, could devote themselves to prayer and the ministry of the word. Now, I don't want to push that one too far because for them that was a real distraction. Uh, for Michael and Holly, as I say, it works out about one hour every six or eight weeks. So the analogy uh, doesn't go all the way. But, um, you know, we've, we've got a permanent full time pastor. Uh, the world view would be that it's right and reasonable that he gets involved in every aspect of the church. Um, but it's not the biblical view. The biblical pattern, very clearly, is that people with gifts of ministry, teaching and leadership should be free to devote themselves to that. And the more practical tasks should be picked up by people who've got appropriate gifts in that area. Whether cleaning is a gift or a natural ability, uh, I'll leave it to you to decide. But uh, it's genuinely not that demanding and it would be great to have a few more people sharing the burden there. So uh, if, you, if you'd like to think about it, you don't necessarily need to get to the road set fully. Um, you can drop in and out as, you, uh, as, as you're available. So if you'd like to know more about that, speak to Angela, who will give you uh, a neutral and non-persuasive explanation of what's involved. And if you speak to me, I'll give you the forms to sign. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. There's other opportunities to serve as well. The Cameo team could do some extra help as well. That's on a, a Wednesday, helping um, with the young people, uh, maybe in the kitchen. So if you'd like to be involved with parents and toddlers, uh, perhaps best speaking to Andrew Parsons at the moment, as uh, Kath Jones, as you know, is unwell. Uh, Kath did come out of hospital a couple of days ago, and she's now with her son, um, Ian moment. Also, we've got a holiday club planned for October half term. If you would like to be involved in that, please speak to me. Now you might be sat there thinking, I'd love to be uh, cleaning the church, or I'd love to be helping at parents and toddlers, or I'd definitely love to be at holiday club, but I'm at an age and stage of life where it would just require too much energy. Is there any way that I can serve? Well, our youth clubs on Friday night are recruiting, don't worry, not people to come down to church, but we're recruiting people to pray specifically for our youth clubs on a Friday night, baseline and also prime. So if you would like to be committed to praying on a Friday night for the youth clubs, again, please speak to me and you will get specific prayer requests to be able to pray intelligently for those things. <clears throat> Still a few more announcements to go. There is a women's event at Radcliffe Baptist Church Bury, uh, Caring God's Way, on the 8th of October. That's a full day conference. Um, their information went out on Friday's email. It looks really great. If you would like to go to that, please speak to Angela, and please do that by this Friday. It's our Mission Focus Month right through September on the work of SIM. We have two Dear friends, Megumi and Helen Fazakli, who are missionaries over in Malawi, if you would like to serve them financially, please speak to Eddie McLeave, or just for more information, please speak to Eddie. And then also at this point, I need to um, pass on some sad news to our church family. Last night, Bill Dysart passed away in Wigan Infirmary. Uh, Bill, a faithful servant here for many years at the church, uh, loved by everyone that you can, I'm sure. Um, but Bill has gone to be with the Lord Jesus, which is far better. But please do pray for Mary and the rest of his family at this difficult time. We're going to worship God together, and I'm going to read some words from Psalm 95 to help us reflect before we stand together to sing. In Psalm 95, there are some things in these verses for us to believe, and also um, there are some things just to reflect on as we come 
to worship God. This is what he says as in part of Psalm 95. He says, come let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. For he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture, the flock under his care. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. We are to bow down or kneel, these verses tell us. That speaks of an attitude of heart, recognising God's greatness. Who is this God we have come to worship? He is the one who made us, the one who cares for us. How does he care to us? for us? He cares for us by speaking to us. And the call or the challenge for each and every one of us is to have an attitude of heart, of humility, not to harden our hearts, but to allow him to speak to us and for us to change, to respond accordingly. I wonder if we're willing to do that. Let's stand together to say, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Let's stand. morning that God is seated on his throne. He is from everlasting to everlasting. As a church family, there are many people who are going through really difficult times at the moment. Those who are mourning, those who are sick, those who are facing difficult decisions, those unable to cope. Of course, we remember at this time the McMahons, 
the Dice Arts, and also um, Kelly Cassidy and her family as well, who are all grieving. As a nation as well, so much is happening. Tomorrow, the funeral service will be held for Queen Elizabeth II. And so at this time, let's all come and bow our heads together and let's approach the throne of God, our great God. Prayer makes such a difference. So let's come and speak to him together on behalf of those who most desperately need our prayers. Let's bow our heads. Loving, caring Father, we thank you that at all times we're able to come to you in prayer. We have this privilege because of our trust in the Lord Jesus. Because of that, we know that you are not counting our sins against us, but instead you view us as your own sons and daughters. What a wonderful blessing it is to know that you love us and delight in us. That's not something we have earned, not something we deserve, but something you declare to be true. Father, life seems to be very hard at the moment. The trials and suffering we see going on in the lives of others, and some of us are experiencing ourselves threatened to steal our joy. They tempt us to think the world is out of control. They maybe even would cause us to think that you are not good. Please forgive us for such thoughts that come from unbelief. Help us to view all things properly, remembering sin and its consequences. A reminder that all of us must run to Jesus for refuge. Through him, we have certain salvation. Thank you that Jesus endured the worst type of suffering. He was made sin and faced your displeasure, the displeasure that we deserve. So that ultimately we need fear no evil. Thank you for that great reality. We commit all our church family into your keeping this morning. We pray that you would strengthen each one according to their needs. Please give them strength and courage and comfort for each new day. We, we pray especially for Mary this morning. Lord, please draw near to her and her family. Would she know your comfort and peace? We pray again for the McMahons and also for the Cassidys. For them as well, as they are grieving the loss of loved ones, please draw near to them. Please strengthen their faith and put a hedge around them. We also at this time pray for the royal family and ask that you would be gracious to them. As they mourn the loss of mother, grandmother, great-grandmother, the world is watching their grief is being televised. Help them in that immensely difficult situation. We thank you again for the life of the Queen and the faith she had in the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask, please, would that trust that sinners can be forgiven by simple faith, would that be explained really clearly tomorrow? Would there be no confusion as to what it means to know Jesus? As, own, as your own personal saviour. We pray that tomorrow, as that service is televised, that many additional people would, there, would take their place in the eternal kingdom as they come to put their trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. We also pray for our new king, our new prime minister, the new cabinet. Please help them to lead in such a way that we can live peaceful lives in all godliness and holiness. We pray that through the governance of our country, we will be able to live enjoying gospel freedoms and your church would flourish as a result. And we offer all these prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. So often our words fail us when we are experiencing different things. We don't know how to express uh, things well. And the songwriters help us, don't they? The songwriters help us to put into words what we perhaps couldn't. So let's stand together to sing two hymns. Lord, I come before your throne of grace, and then he will hold me fast. Let's stand. <laughs>
is a noble task. Now the overseer must be above reproach. The husband of but one wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given to drunkenness, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him with proper respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders, so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. Amen. May God bless to us the public reading of his word. At this point, Junior Church and Crash will head down to their classes. A couple of weeks ago, the big question dominating the news headlines was who is going to be the next Prime Minister? Uh, much has happened since then, uh, we know the answer to that question, but back then it was up to members of the Conservative Party to vote. What were members looking for in a candidate, do you think? Someone who could deliver a good speech? Someone who would offer the biggest tax cuts? Uh, maybe one who was able to uh, think quickest on their feet, perhaps someone who was photogenic, maybe someone who had been to Eton or not been to Eton. But let me ask you a question this morning. Which do you think is more important? Um, do you think it's most important what particular skill set you have, so that is what you can do, or do you think it's actually more important to be a person of integrity, a person of noble character? <coughs> so who you are. Two weeks ago, we started a mini three-week series that comes to an end today. Um, but it's my hope and prayer that although the series comes to an end, the impact will be long-lasting. And what we've been considering over the last three weeks ending today 
is what God has to say about his church. Specifically, how his church should be led. So week one, we thought about why we should have elders, and we saw that it's God's good intention for the church to have multiple elders, and that's for the spiritual good of the church. On week two, last week, um, Sam covered what elders do, and Sam pointed to bi the biblical picture of a shepherd explaining that elders, they protect, <coughs> tend, and lead. And week three, today, we are thinking about who should be an elder. And part of what we're going to see this morning, not all, part of what we're going to see is that although there are requirements of what an elder has to be able to do, so the skill set, if you like, the primary focus is actually on who they are, their character. So we're going to see that actually character is of primary importance. And just to let you know, what we've been looking at over the last few weeks have all been from God's Word. It's our settled conviction here at Hope Church. And if we want to know how to do things, then we're going to have to come back to what God has taught in the Bible to know how things should be ordered. There are many other voices around us, voices in culture, voices of what other people, other churches do. But we want to hear the voice of God and see what he has to say and then follow accordingly. Not that it's not important to listen to other voices, but chiefly it's God's voice that really matters. If you try to summarise what a church is or what a church does, I wonder what answer you would come up with. Well, on one occasion, when Paul was writing to Timothy, in fact, it's just later in the, the book that we read from earlier, the letter we read from earlier, you would see that Paul writes these words about the church of the living God. He says the church of the living God is the pillar and foundation of the truth. So in your mind, try to picture a pillar or a column, okay? But this pillar or column is made up of people. Now that makes it really hard to try and get that image in your mind, a pillar or a column made up of people. And on top of that column or pillar of people is a beautiful, precious treasure. And what that precious treasure is, is the truth about Jesus. The pillar's main task is to put on display that treasure. And in the same way, the church, as the pillar or foundation of the truth, the church's main job is to put on display the truth about the Lord Jesus Christ. So we are, as a church, truth upholders. We are truth proclaimers. There are many good things that a church can do and should do, but not if it comes at the expense of upholding, proclaiming the truth about Jesus. That is to follow in the steps of Jesus, by the way. If you remember, Jesus on one occasion was surrounded by pressing need. There were many people that were wanting him to heal them. And this is what Jesus said. When he was surrounded by people who needed his healing ministries, healing miracles. Jesus said, let us go somewhere else to the nearby villages so that I can preach there also. So the most loving man to ever walk on planet Earth knew his purpose to preach, to uphold the truth, and he stuck to his purpose, even though there were legion, many, many other things, good things, that he could have done. Now, immediately after Paul states that the church is the pillar and foundation of the truth, he then talks about godliness. What is godliness? Well, godliness is to live in a way that's pleasing to God. Or to put it in other words, living in obedience to the truth. So the truth that we as a church proclaim or uphold is a truth that transforms. So what is it we believe? Well, we believe that Jesus died in our place for our moral crimes against God. 
We are forgiven because of Jesus. That fills us with peace and joy. We accept that Jesus Christ is the risen Lord. He is seated on an eternal throne. He rules eternally. We believe that. And so the impact is, because we believe he's Lord, we stop doing things he doesn't want us to do, and we start doing the things he wants us to do, because we believe he's Lord. Believing the truth that God made us for a relationship with himself, and that relationship is primary above any other relationship, if we believe that, then that starts to have an impact on what we do in our leisure time, what time we set our alarm clock for, maybe. It starts to have an impact how we live. A church which upholds the truth is also a church that's being transformed by the truth because they live consistently with it. The other day I was watching a YouTube video, and it was a YouTube video that was sponsored, which means a company was paying the person doing the YouTube video to mention their particular product during the video. So this guy stops his video, and he says, this video was sponsored by, and I'm not going to tell you who it was by, he's not sponsoring me to do this sermon, so I'm going to be silent on that. But this a video is sponsored by, and he started to talk about the company, and the product that they sell. And he was explaining why that product was better than any other product you could possibly get. He was saying how amazing it was. And I wanted to ask him, which I couldn't, because it was a video, this question. Do you use the product? Now you've got your paycheck, do you still use the product? Do you still have it? Because you can say all this good stuff about this product, <laughs> But after the video is ended, if you then just stop using the product, then actually, what does that say about it? We can announce that Jesus saves. We can announce that Jesus changes lives, that he is the death defeater, that he forgives sin. We can announce that we really need to follow him. But if our lives are no different to anyone else, what does that say about the truth we uphold? Now, what's all that got to do with the question on the screen? Who should be an elder? Well, since the church is the pillar and foundation of the truth, those who lead the church must be people who know the truth, who love the truth, and have been transformed by the truth. Well, let me put it differently. An elder must be someone who knows Jesus, who loves Jesus, is being transformed by Jesus. Being a leader in a church is not primarily about status, position, and power. It's about serving. It's about setting an example. It's about defending the truth living consistently with the truth. I love this illustration. It's a bit like being out on a country walk, and you're surrounded by this group of people who you love. And, and a leader is someone who knows the terrain where you are walking, and, and is saying to those around them, come this way. As we walk through this valley, this, this is what we're going to need to do to get through this. Let me help you over that style. Do not go in that bog. I made that mistake, I ended up in there. You do not want to go anywhere near that. And although not all-encompassing, that's a great picture of what leaders do. Who are familiar with the landscape, know the truth, and are being transformed by it. So let's look at the details. First, an elder will have a certain character, and he will be a godly character. Some words from these verses. I'm just going to do all the ones that are about character all at once. Above reproach temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, not given to drunkenness, not violent, gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money, have a good reputation with outsiders. Now, of course, we don't have the time to drill down into each one of those different um, characteristics. And in some ways, what's remarkable about them is the fact that they are not spectacular in some senses. All Christians, are called to such a life. We could go to various places in the New Testament 
and it will show you that being a follower of Jesus looks like those words, those phrases that I just read out. If you are a follower of Jesus, you will be increasingly growing that in your life. So in one sense, they are not spectacular. This is the normal Christian life. I mean, if we were just to write a list of somebody who should leave the blood-bought flock of Christ, we would come up with many of those things, wouldn't we? So the list is not spectacular, but they do seem like a tall order, especially in verse 2, when you see that it begins with the emphatic, now the overseer must be. He must be those things. He must be above reproach. But we mustn't understand what Paul is describing here. He is not on the hunt for someone who is morally perfect. The New Testament is clear that each and every one of us battles against sin. If God's requirement for leadership was perfection, there would be an extreme shortage of candidates. But let me point out that one huge part of the Christian life is actually recognising our own spiritual poverty. Learning what it means to trust daily in the Lord Jesus Christ. Learning what it means to repent, to turn away from sin, and to grow in Christ-likeness. To grow in saying no to the flesh our own way, and yes to the Lord Jesus Christ. So an elder must be someone who is engaging in that spiritual conflict, who is seeking to say no to the flesh, is seeking to grow in walking in the ways of the Lord. One person writes this, being above reproach means that an elder is to be the kind of man who no one suspects of any wrongdoing or immorality. People will be shocked to hear this kind of man charged with such acts. If there's an accusation, people wouldn't believe it. Outsiders are not saying that person is leading the church. That doesn't make any sense to me when I know what that person is like. An elder is in control of himself, self-controlled. He's welcoming to other people. Jesus is his treasure, not money. Now that doesn't, of course, just relate to people who are in the employment of the church. If somebody cannot handle their own finances in a godly way, then they'll not be able to handle the church's finances in a godly way either. An elder must not be given to drunkenness. There mustn't be a turning to alcohol to get through the week. Elders must have a godly character. Now, another <clears throat> aspect of uh, an elder, elder's life, is an elder in the home uh, must also show these characteristics of leadership. So again, let me pick up some words and phrases. So we see, now the overseer must be the husband of but one wife. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him with proper respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? So if you want to know if someone is qualified to lead a church, you need to watch how he leads his family. If you want to know if someone should be trusted with Christ's bride, see how he treats his own bride. Now, I don't think um, people are disqualified here, men are disqualified who are single or who don't have children. Jesus was single, um, and it appears Paul was as well. Paul writes this difficult to understand uh, sentence that the overseer must be the husband of one wife. Some translate that a man of one woman. What does Paul mean? Well, at the very least, it conveys the idea of a faithful husband who is committed to his wife and seeks to love her as Christ loved the church. So a man, this man must not be a flirt. He must not be known for leading other women on. He must be putting to death sexual immorality. <clears throat> Excuse me. His approach to other women should be like that to a sister or a mother. Pastor Al Martin said this, what does someone in your church do when a non-Christian walks through the door and asks them how a Christian man should treat his wife? You know what they should do? They should point to one of the elders and say, watch him, he's one of the elders. You need to watch the way he tenderly, lovingly, 
and sacrificially cherishes that woman next to him. Also, an elder, he must, um, his children must obey what he says. If he can't handle his family, if he can't lead in the home, he shouldn't be responsible in handling the church. So elders must have a godly character, and they must also behave in a certain way in the home. Now, many of the things that we've mentioned so far are not, they're not spectacular, they're not things that are out of the ordinary, but now, what we're going to think about, just for our last few moments, is the things that uniquely apply to an elder. So these are things that are unique to an elder. <laughs> this is what makes someone an elder. And that is, they should have a desire to be an elder. So an elder must want to be an elder. So look at verse 1. If anyone sets his heart on being an overseer, he desires a noble task. It's something this person has in his heart. Or 1 Peter 5, 2. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, serving as overseers. Not because you must, but because you are willing. So God puts the desire in a person's heart to make them an elder. Now that's not a desire like I have a desire for a milkshake or something like that. It's when someone understands the truth that there is a God who loves us, we've ignored him and we deserve his judgment, but he sent his son to die in our place, and that by simple faith we are forgiven and brought into his family. When someone has grasped that truth, that there is this wonderful good news to, procl to proclaim to the nations, when that truth gets hold of you, you feel the burden to take up the mantle, to own the responsibility and serve God's people. That's what it means. And there are times, of course, when the responsibility is hard and it feels like too much. Of course there are times like that. There are times, of course, when you just think, I wish I could be somewhere else doing something else. But by God's Spirit, He impresses on your heart that there is no greater privilege than serving the Lord by serving His people. An elder must have a desire to be an elder. Also, quite obviously, an elder must be able to teach. And this follows, doesn't it? So again, we just, we just see that in verse 2, it's right at the very end. You must be able to teach. If we are truth upholders, truth proclaimers, then someone who is leading in that obviously must be able to explain the good news about Jesus to other people in a way that people will understand. Now, in a sense, all Christians are, are called to pursue teaching one another. So in Colossians 3, 16, it says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. <coughs> but there is a special calling or responsibility on the life of an elder to be able to teach the Bible to other people. Now, that doesn't mean necessarily being able to preach but it does mean being able to understand, handle the Bible, and explain it to somebody else in, in whatever context. It would seem that the expectation in churches is that there will be elders who have the responsibility of the majority of the preaching and teaching. So we see that in 1 Timothy 5, 17. It says there, the elders who direct the affairs of the church, well, are worthy of double honour, especially those who work, whose work is preaching and teaching. Now that's what you would expect, isn't it? If you're in a church setting like we are, where there is a, a paid pastor elder, then obviously that pastor elder doesn't have time constraints of other employment. Instead, they have the responsibility of studying the word to be able to explain and preach the Bible in mainly more than any of the other elders. So, there must be a desire, must be able to teach. Now, something that's very countercultural and controversial. God's word says that an elder in a church uh, should be a man. And that's not because men are more godly than women, quite the opposite often. Nor is it that men are necessarily better Bible teachers. No, it's just because it's God's pattern, it's God's design. 
Uh, this goes against cultural norms, of course it does. It goes against naturally what we might think, and so we have a choice. Do we listen to God's words? Or do we go with our own ideas? Or, our, or what our culture says? And of course, we're going to side with God and his word. So in 1 Timothy and also in Titus, the instruction is given that an overseer must be the husband of one wife. In 1 Timothy, Paul gives a prohibition against women teaching men within the church context. In 2 Timothy, Paul instructs Timothy to train other men who are able to teach others also. In 1 Corinthians, Paul reinforces male headship. In Ephesians, husbands are instructed to sacrificially lead their families, lovingly laying down their lives for them as their wives respect and honour them. That order within the home is a glorious picture of the gospel. It points to Christ's relationship with his church. And that, of course, parallels the role of an elder within a church. If we go back to Genesis chapter 2, in perfection, before any sin, we see the same order. Now, unfortunately, sin distorts God's good design in this. It also, sin distorts our attitudes towards this. Now, often, what is rejected or dismissed as being from a different century, is not what God ordained in his word, but a sin-spoiled caricature, which often looks like abuse of power or harsh, loveless authority. That is not what is called for in the Bible. The reality is so, so different. Husbands are called to sacrificially lovingly lead and serve their family, laying down their lives for them, choosing to go without, choosing to say no to their own desires. We must not be domineering dictators, neither must we be absent, passive deserters of our responsibility. Male leadership in a church or home has nothing to do with value, importance, getting your own way, but it has everything to do with servant-hearted <clears throat> leadership, laying down your life for the good of those God has entrusted into your care. It's well worth spending time thinking and reflecting on some of those verses. Also, another requirement, an elder must not be a recent convert. Why not? Well, the, da the danger is, that a new believer, when appointed to such a position, becomes puffed up, inflated, <coughs> too big for their own boots. Humility turns to pride. So what do you do if you're a relatively new believer, but you feel like you can teach, you feel like you're growing in godliness, and you're a man, what do you do? Well, start to do what an elder does. Love people. Pray for people. Serve people. Whenever you get an opportunity, you sat next to somebody, bring the Bible to bear on their life. You do not need a badge that says you're an elder to do any of those things. And before too long, if that's how you're living your life, it will not take long in the Lord's goodness for the people around you to ask you to consider the role. So that is a really fast whistle-stop tour of what, of who, should be an elder. I'm aware that we've covered so much ground and we could spend a full sermon on each one of those points that we've considered this morning. And so please do come and ask if you would like any clarification. So the question is now, well, what now? And just for a few moments, I'd like to make some specific comments that are specific to Hope Church and hopefully answer some questions that people have asked me um, over the last well, few months now. So currently at Hope Church, <coughs> there is one group of men <coughs> who lead the church, and they are referred to as the church council. You may have heard the title also, Managing Trustees, and that's the title that the Charities Commission gives uh, to people who are responsible for leading the charity. So we have the same <coughs> title, the same group of people. And throughout the church's 140-year existence, the church council, which can of say has changed during those 140 oh. years, were not the same people. Uh, during those 140 years, the church council is comprised of different men with different gifts, 
Um, and some, you could say, have done more of the role of an elder, and others, you could say, have done more the role of practical responsibilities, but they have had the oversight for spiritual and practical things. When I was appointed as a pastor, I was given the main responsibility of spiritual oversight with the support of the church council. And can I put on record what a joy it's been to serve with the church council over the last 13 years? Do we always agree on everything? No, it would, be, it would be a poor do if we did. But we have unity in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's a joy and that's a privilege. When we were looking at what elders do in more detail, we agreed that as a church council, that's not what we're doing as a, as a group, um, not all together. And so we aimed to speak about church elders uh, with, with our church family, with a view to looking to make that a reality at some point in the future. Um, appointing church elders will hopefully remove any ambiguity. It will hopefully make things much clearer as to the group who are spiritually responsible, ensuring that none of these things are neglected. So what next? Well, please speak to me or anyone else on the church council if you've got any questions about what you've heard over the last three weeks. Please pray about what you've heard over the last three weeks. And what about to the who? Well, we want everybody to be involved in this. In the New Testament, on some occasions, it was apostles that went to a church and they picked the elders. Now, there are no apostles around anymore, so we can't do that. On some occasions, apostles delegated responsibility to appointing elders to trusted mission partners. We also have records in the New Testament of the church being involved in selecting people for leadership positions. And so it's our prayer that we would all pray, seek the Lord, and the Lord would lay it on suitably qualified men to want to do this. So when you're listening to this sermon, have been listening, maybe there's people that jump into your mind, or maybe a few people. Well, go and speak to them, pray about it, consider the passages and many others in the New Testament. And go speak to them and ask if they have the desire to serve in that way. And if you do, please let me or one of the church council know. Just because someone is suggested and they want to, doesn't necessarily mean that they will become an elder at this time. But this isn't a static thing. It's an ongoing thing, an ongoing conversation. So please do have some input in that. What about if you desire this? Well, ask yourself these questions. Are these qualifications my compass? Are they, my, are, they, are they the direction I am heading in? Do others think I measure up to them? So I want to ask someone that's close to you. Would I want to be part of a church that was led by someone like me? Some really helpful questions for us to ask ourselves. We've covered much ground and prayer is absolutely essential. So I've asked Eddie at this point to come and pray before we stand to sing. Our final hymn. Thank you, Eddie. Shall we pray? Almighty God and Heavenly Father, as we bow before you now, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for his shed blood and the righteousness credited to us through him. We thank you now for the teaching we have received over the past three weeks on church government. Thank you for the God-given instructions, clear la laid out in the scriptures, how we should function as a church. And we thank you for the clear biblical guidelines on the role of elders in the church. And we pray that these characteristics, as laid out in 1 Timothy 3, are taken to heart, and that you would establish and raise up those within, those who may have that desire to aspire to the position of an elder, and to step out in faith to fulfill this God-given role. We pray that all our lives uh, we would strive to attain uh, the many qualities that you expect from your children. And thank you that in Christ we have all we need for life and godliness. So help us, Father. Help us all to acknowledge our responsibilities as a your local church here at home, to be faithful to your word, to seek and submit to your will and purposes and we pray that as a church family you will give us 
the insight and the means to move forward together and that we will grow in grace and live lives pleasing to you. Equip us, Father, for the task in hand, praying this in Jesus' name and to your glory. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together to sing our final hymn. And that hymn is Lord for the Years. If you're using the book, it's number 428. Let's stand to sing Lord for the Years. Your love has kept and guided. and God our Father, who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times and in every way. The Lord be with all of you. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Amen.